Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General of the Sorbonne University, Mr. Mr. ADG, Deputy Director General of UNESCO, <laughs> colleagues, distinguished guests, friends, um, I thought of starting with a story. More than 500 years ago, the city of Nijmegen, in, in my Nijmegen. home country, the Netherlands, established a Latin school the forerunner of the current public grammar school and the university in that, uh, in that city. And I, I was curious about the history of this, uh, of this school. And I came across the minutes of a meeting of the city council in December 1599. And there had been a discussion about the skirmishes um, at the school during the autumn, including uh, flight, uh, fights between students, between lecturers, um, uh, that resulted in injury. And in those days, I learned from those minutes, the lecturers were carrying uh, swords provided by the town to keep order during class. Um, and as some lecturers apparently were using their weapons 
too eagerly and without many scruples, the council decided to ban the swords as of the 1st of January of the year 1600. Um, the rector obviously was exempted from this measure. He could keep his, his sword. In, in compensation, I, I read, the lecturers were to be given black robes which, according to those same minutes, would give them the same kind of standing the swords had given them. So the morale, obviously, of this is that injustices are of all times. Now, jumping ahead over 400 years to, the, to, the day, to, to today, and I, I should say that I cannot imagine a more fitting location to mark the 20th anniversary of the 1997 UNESCO recommendation concerning the status of higher education teaching personnel. The immense contribution this university has made to France and to the world was, I think, due to its independence and also to the importance it always attached to academic freedom, well, that is to say, throughout most of its history. Uh, it enabled students, lecturers, researchers, academics to pursue their inquiries without censorship. But there's also a less, a less glorious reason, if you will, um, to get together here at the Sorbonne. Um, the poor terms of employ and employment conditions of academic staff here in France, the complete neglect of the standards that we set in 1997. Precarious work today is the norm for too many. And finally, colleagues, there is also the Sorbonne's president, Georges Haddad, um, who I have the honor of introducing to you. He's not only a good friend of EI, but also one of the authors of the UNESCO recommendation which we are here to discuss today. I'm sure that you have seen the, the banner. Um, you know what it means. It's our current predicament. The tree of knowledge, full of history, ideas, and theories. But this tree that we all hold so dear is under threat by those who wish to cut its branches, to prevent its growth, not to mention the extreme weather conditions, <coughs> ri ripping it from its roots, leaving it to rot. But let me stop this somewhat awkward <laughs> analogy. Um, and return to the recommendation text, which is, is crucial to forging our way uh, uh, forward. Uh, let me start by saying that the main provisions of the recommendation are, are yet to be implemented 20 years after its adoption. In too many parts of the world, academic and sci scientific vigor are being replaced with alternative theories, facts, and truths. The rights and freedoms of higher education personnel are, are trampled upon. So as much as we would like to celebrate this recommendation today, this is a moment to be retrospective and, and look at ways in which it can be used to re-strengthen, to defend, and to promote higher education and the rights of women and men who work tire tirelessly every day to help young people and adults to reach their fullest potential. I expect that all of us in this room share the view that we must support our lecturers. We must support researchers and academics and that we must strengthen the teaching profession, and that we must combine forces and work harder to achieve quality education for all. I believe it's important to remember that there is a social 
human dynamic at the core of quality teaching and learning. Higher education teaching personnel are part of the glue that holds society together. They create bonds within groups and create the bridges across groups and communities. Nation building, but also peace, are essential mandates and functions for education. And this makes academics very, very vulnerable. Sometimes they are squeezed between political groupings, caught between ethnic, linguistic, and religious rivalries, or simply targeted by public authorities. A recent example of this is the dismissal of up to 20,000 teachers and academics in Turkey. Uh, another was the arrest and incarceration of one of our colleagues in Colombia simply for researching a topic that was not accepted by the government. This loss of professional freedom causes academics to engage in self-censorship. And this does not bode well for the profession and for society. Also, far too many academics and researchers work on short-term contracts, and this alone makes them vulnerable and forces them to toe the line. Just let's imagine where we would be if the brilliant minds who adorned these halls never had the chance to share their ideas, to examine their world. We would be far worse off. Higher education is, in our opinion, about expanding minds, making people critical of their surroundings, their tropes, their politics. And it's about making contribution to society as a whole. The transfer of basic and advanced knowledge and skills is at the core of our mission and must be protected. Let us, there, let us therefore take bold steps to understand and tackle the challenges facing higher education personnel today. Let us get the 1997 recommendation out of the shadows and press upon governments and employers everywhere to fully implement its provisions. And having said that, it is a great honor for me to introduce Georges Haddad, president of the Sorbonne, and as I've said, a very good friend of EI. Georges. Thank you. Sir. Merci, Fred. Je suis très touché par uh, tes paroles. J'espère que le français vous va. Il y a une traduction, hein. je crois que la traduction est prévue. I could start in English, I could speak in English, but at Sorbonne, it's my duty to speak in French. OK. Non, c'est mon grand plaisir de vous accueillir dans cette salle qui est la salle du conseil d'administration de l'université Panthéon-Sorbonne que j'ai l'honneur euh, de présider. Et c'est la salle où nous avons tous ces grands débats sur le statut, sur les conditions de vie et de travail des personnels de l'université parisien Panthéon-Sorbonne. Donc vous pouvez imaginer combien cette salle est animée, est agitée par des débats euh, très importants pour la vie de l'université et pour les conditions de vie et de travail des personnels de l'enseignement supérieur. Et bien entendu, ne l'oublions pas, des étudiants, hein, des étudiants qui sont le cœur même de notre mission. Alors, j'ai l'honneur d'accueillir aussi euh, Monsieur Kian Tang, sous-directeur général de l'UNESCO pour l'éducation, Edem Adoubra, qui est là, qui s'occupe de, des teachers, des enseignants à l'UNESCO, et de retrouver des amis, des amis très proches, avec lesquels j'ai eu la chance d'agir et d'œuvrer pendant les quelques années que j'ai passé à l'UNESCO, euh, à la euh, division de l'enseignement supérieur, et aujourd'hui est une journée particulière parce que c'est une journée de célébration. Nous célébrons le 20e anniversaire de la recommandation pour les personnels de l'enseignement supérieur. Et M. Tang et moi-même, Kian Tang et moi-même, nous étions à la célébration du 25e anniversaire d'une des plus belles réalisations de l'UNESCO, c'est-à-dire le programme des chères UNESCO. Et il y a de nombreuses chères UNESCO, n'est-ce pas, EDEM, euh, qui abordent la question des personnels, de l'éducation et des enseignants. Alors, ce que je voudrais dire quand il s'agit des personnels de l'enseignement supérieur, à la différence des personnels de l'éducation, 
c'est que être un enseignant du supérieur, ce n'est pas être simplement un enseignant. Un enseignant du supérieur doit être impliqué dans la recherche. On ne peut pas prétendre à être un enseignant du supérieur si on n'est pas au contact de la recherche. L'université, comme vous le savez toutes et tous, est un lieu magique, un lieu unique, dans lequel se transmettent les savoirs, mais aussi, et de manière essentielle, se produisent les savoirs nouveaux par la recherche. Notre université, Panthéon-Sorbonne, héritière de la Sorbonne, transmet les savoirs, délivre des diplômes, mais essentiellement également, produit des savoirs à travers ses centres de recherche, ses laboratoires et sa capacité à coopérer à l'international en particulier avec différentes universités et centres de recherche à travers le monde. L'université parisien Panthéon-Sorbonne, héritière de la Sorbonne, compte plus de 400 partenaires universitaires dans le monde, des États-Unis à, à l'Europe, du Japon, de la Chine aux pays Arabe, mais aussi à l'Afrique et à tous les pays de l'Amérique latine qui sont des partenaires essentiels pour nous. Donc, je le répète, lorsqu'on aborde le statut et les conditions de travail des personnels de l'enseignement supérieur, il faut aborder la question de la recherche, la capacité à accomplir sa mission à travers la production des savoirs, la participation à des grands programmes scientifiques innovant et créatif et donner à tous les enseignants du supérieur cette capacité à œuvrer à la production des savoirs nouveaux par la recherche. Alors, lorsqu'on parle des libertés académiques, ce ne sont pas simplement les libertés d'enseigner. Bien sûr, il faut enseigner, enseigner des, à travers des, des programmes innovants, créatifs, modernes, mais aussi être capable d'alimenter nos enseignements par les productions de la recherche. Et je le répète de manière un peu, peut-être, excessive, mais un enseignant du supérieur qui enseigne le même enseignement pendant 20 ans ne peut plus prétendre au statut d'enseignant du supérieur. Il faut que nos enseignements soient en permanence irrigués par l'innovation, par les productions de ces savoirs. Et la liberté d'un enseignant du supérieur passe aussi par la liberté de créer d'innover et de participer à cette grande aventure du savoir. Donc là aussi, dans le statut des personnels de l'enseignement supérieur, il faut aborder cette question de cette liberté académique d'être à la pointe de la connaissance, du progrès et de la connaissance. Et je vous promets que c'est un sacré défi. Dans certains pays, les enseignants du supérieur n'ont pas cette possibilité de faire de la recherche, n'ont pas cette possibilité d'intégrer des laboratoires de recherche, des centres de recherche qui leur permettent d'innover et d'alimenter leur enseignement de tous les progrès de la connaissance. C'est pour cela que je pense que dans cette recommandation, il faudrait insister fortement sur la dimension recherche du métier d'enseignant du supérieur. Donc là, voilà quelques éléments que je voudrais développer. Il n'y a pas de statut d'enseignant du supérieur sans un statut de chercheur qui me paraît essentiel. Comme l'a dit Fred aussi, le métier d'enseignant, d'une manière globale, est un métier qui est en péril aujourd'hui. C'est un métier fondamental pour les valeurs démocratiques. Euh, les valeurs naissent justement de l'enseignement et les éducateurs jouent un rôle fondamental à travers leur enseignement euh, pour promouvoir et défendre les grandes valeurs de la démocratie à l'université comme dans les écoles primaires et dans les écoles secondaires, la démocratie se construit à travers l'éducation. Il n'y a pas d'avenir démocratique sans une éducation libre, responsable, qui permet de transmettre ces valeurs. Et là aussi, il faut défendre le statut de l'enseignant pour qu'il soit justement porteur de ces valeurs et qu'il puisse les transmettre à tous ces jeunes qui font confiance à l'éducation pour construire leur dimension citoyenne, être des citoyens d'un monde démocratique, de paix, de partage et de solidarité. Donc là aussi, c'est une donnée fondamentale, mais je terminerai sur une autre donnée, et Fred l'a mentionné, c'est la précarisation du métier d'enseignement supérieur à travers le monde. 
Là aussi, c'est un grand défi. C'est un très grand défi, comme je le disais à Fred, et hier je le disais dans une grande émission sur l'éducation euh, à la télé française, il y a 40 ans, plus de 40 ans, quand j'ai commencé ma carrière d'enseignant, j'étais assistant, bien sûr, assistant professeur, il a fallu me loger à Paris. Je cherchais un logement à Paris et figurez-vous qu'à l'époque, mon salaire d'assistant m'a permis en un jour de trouver un logement à Paris, au centre de Paris. Aujourd'hui, c'est impossible. Il est impossible pour un jeune chercheur, enseignant, chercheur français de se loger au centre de Paris avec le salaire qui est le sien. Là aussi, c'est une donnée fondamentale et nous avons mené dans mon laboratoire de recherche, je suis mathématicien, une étude. Il faut savoir qu'en France, en particulier, et dans d'autres pays, euh, les conditions de vie et de travail des enseignants sup euh, du supérieur et des enseignants en général a baissé et le pouvoir d'achat d'un enseignant à niveau égal a baissé en 20 ans de 30%. 30%, 30%, c'est une réalité. Et ne l'oublions pas, un enseignant et un chercheur doivent vivre. C'est un être humain qui doit avoir une vie confortable, une vie digne, pour qu'il puisse assigner, euh, assumer sa mission confortablement. Donc là aussi, c'est une donnée essentielle. Et il faut que nous nous battions ensemble pour que le statut d'enseignant et d'enseignant du supérieur tienne compte des conditions de vie et d'accomplissement des carrières à travers une vie décente. Aujourd'hui, les enseignants que j'ai, que j'accueille dans mon université, vivent à 40, 50 km de Paris. C'est une heure, une heure et demie de transport aller, une heure, une heure et demie de transport pour le retour. Vous imaginez cette perte de temps et d'énergie. Ce n'est pas vrai uniquement pour les enseignants. Aujourd'hui, c'est une donnée essentielle et ne peuvent vivre à Paris que des gens qui ont des revenus confortables. Et malheureusement, euh, les jeunes enseignants-chercheurs qui commencent leur carrière ne peuvent plus assumer un logement à Paris. Et ça vaut pour toutes les grandes villes de France et d'Europe. Donc là aussi, n'ayons pas peur d'aborder les questions matérielles. Ne restons pas uniquement euh, dans les données abstraites du métier d'enseignant-chercheur. Toutes ces valeurs de transmission, de générosité, un enseignant, c'est un être humain qui doit vivre et qui mérite le respect. Donc voilà en grande partie les débats que je suis obligé et amené à mener dans mes conseils pour encourager les jeunes et les générations futures à assumer cette grande et noble mission qui nous réunit aujourd'hui, celle de transmettre les savoirs, celle de produire les savoirs et celle de partager les savoirs. Je vous remercie et je suis heureux de vous accueillir Éducation internationale est pour moi ma famille hein, et je lui appartiens. Merci. Uh, could I invite uh, David to step forward and lead the panel discussion that we are going to have now? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank George. you very much. Thank you very much, Fred. Uh, before I begin, I have to say that uh, at the back of the room, you'll find this lovely document, which is a, a summary of the study done by Nellie Stromquist. I also have to say I'm not Nellie, uh, but I'm going to present her study on her behalf, or at least a short summary of it. Unfortunately, Nellie uh, took ill uh, and uh, is unable to be here, but we wish her a speedy recovery. So I want to just walk through a couple of the key findings in the study. Uh, and then David Zazunga, the, the president of the College and Lecturers Association of Zimbabwe, will give a short response, and then we'll move on uh, to our panel. So essentially, uh, Nelly's study uh, identified uh, a couple of touchstones for us in terms of the recommendation. Uh, the first thing to keep in mind is the importance of the recommendation, in particular, the fact that it is the only international instrument that defines academic freedom, 
uh, characterizes the governance, talks about collegial governance of universities and other higher education institutions, and also provides for a basic outline of terms and conditions of service. And on academic freedom in, in particular, I think it's really important to emphasize that the recommendation is a really forward-looking document. Uh, its definition of academic freedom uh, is something we should all aspire to. Essentially, it outlines kind of four, uh, four uh, legs of a chair in terms of what holds up academic freedom. The first is the right to teach uh, without institutional censorship. The second is the right to research and to pursue research without censorship. The third is the right to exercise your intramural speech, that is to criticize the institution or the system in which you work without a censorship or reprisal. And the fourth one, which I think is particularly important in the current political context, is the right to exercise your extramural speech, to speak out publicly as a public intellectual, exercise your civil liberties uh, without uh, facing uh, recrimination. Uh, the recommendation also means that higher education uh, uh, teaching personnel, their, their conditions of work are protected by international guidelines uh, expressed in a document with international validity. It is a recommendation, it's not a legal document, but because uh, many countries have adopted the recommendation, my own country, Canada, adopted it without reservation, it means that we can use it in my association in court cases and arbitration cases, we can refer to the recommendation as a standard setting instrument uh, that uh, governments uh, and institutions should follow. And as one person identified, the adoption of the recommendation was a watershed in the evolution, consolidation, and standardization of the principles promoting academic freedom in the world. And I should say, just on, on a personal note, it's a great pleasure for me to talk about the recommendation because my organization, the Canadian Association of University Teachers, was one of the key constructors of the document. Uh, one of my predecessors, uh, Don Savage, was seconded uh, to UNESCO to draft the recommendation uh, with the uh, support of the Canadian Commission on UNESCO as well. It's also, uh, I should point out that uh, while these are wonderful uh, uh, aspirational principles, as we heard earlier, they're not always followed. And even in countries like Canada, where we adopted it universally without, uh, without reservation, uh, today, in the province of Ontario, uh, 12,000 college faculty are in their third week of a strike. Uh, and the three issues in the strike are stronger protections for academic freedom, better collegial governance, and probably most importantly, uh, limits on the use of precarious academic labor. Uh, right now in the college system in Ontario, 60% of courses are being taught by contract faculty, often paid below uh, a living wage. Uh, so really a serious issue. And if countries like Canada can't uphold the document, we have a big challenge ahead of us. Uh, Nelly goes on to, to point out that the impact of the recommendation has been, uh, I think, relatively muted, I think we have to say. That the awareness of the existence of it is extremely low. A 2012 UNESCO survey that was sent to 623 institutions of higher education found that only 52% even were aware of the existence of the recommendation. In this study, only 15% of the members of European university teaching unions were aware of the, of the existence of the recommendation. So we also, in the trade union movement, I think, have, have to do more in terms of promoting uh, the recommendation. As Nelly points out, uh, the committee of experts uh, concerning the recommendation around teachers meets every three years to look at progress and uh, potential violations of the recommendations. Uh, and there's very limited work conducted between those sessions. In its 50 years of existence, the CART group has received only 24 complaints or allegations, with only two uh, dealing with higher education. I think those involved Denmark and concerning a, a, a legislation uh, that would, was changing the governance of universities. I think the other was Australia, if I'm not mistaken, concerning changes to the higher education workplace relations arrangements. Uh, but as we see from the chart, unfortunately there's a lot of colored countries here, which means there's lots of progress that we need to continue uh, to make in order to see uh, the uh, recommendation uh, be uh, fully uh, realized and implemented. Nelly points to uh, several recommendations or measures that she thinks uh, should be considered in terms of improving uh, 
the, uh, the not, not so much the recommendation itself. I think everyone agrees that the text and the principles are fine. It's more how do we see these things realized. One of the things is, is to make uh, the recommendation and the CARC process better known, uh, clarifying the procedures for submitting allegations to the Committee of Experts. Uh, she recommends that the committee meet more frequently and that uh, UNESCO and the ILO should foster a global dialogue on issues that have arisen since the recommendation came out 20 years ago. 20 years ago, actually, we didn't talk about casualization of academic labor so much. Uh, that's become a major issue now. We didn't talk too much about privatization, and that's become a major issue as well. So these are things that maybe we need to foster some dialogue to see how the recommendation remains relevant in the wake of these new challenges. Uh, Nellie concludes with uh, a couple of uh, suggestions as well that uh, she points out that the recommendation draws its power from the name and shame strategy used by the Committee of Experts but remains largely unknown. Uh, but for it to serve for advocacy uh, purposes, it needs to become more widely distributed and invoked. Uh, she recommends that the dissemination of information about the recommendation uh, be shared by the ILO and UNESCO, including the International Task Force on Teachers, uh, UNESCO National Commissions, and the UNESCO Chairs uh, existing in many universities. And finally, as I alluded to earlier, that EI and its national affiliates should also promote the recommendation more actively and use it in campaigns uh, such as we're doing in Canada right now concerning the college teachers in Ontario. So with that, I will turn it over to, to David, who will give us some of his thoughts and comments on, on Nelly's study. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David. Um, the, it's my pleasure to, to be speaking to uh, issues to do with um, this convention and uh, coming from Africa, uh, particularly Zimbabwe. I think um, I must say uh, that there is little awareness of, uh, if any, of uh, the existence of uh, this recommendation. Um, that is 97. And um, thus, I think I thought that uh, the best would be for me to speak to uh, the practical ways in which we can have uh, international access to, to the recommendation. And uh, um, as a result, I thought I should allude to um, a relationship that we have had with um, some of the AI affiliates, particularly the Canadian Association of the University Teachers, uh, which had to do with uh, the experience that my union, the College Lecturers Association of Zimbabwe, uh, had with the government of Zimbabwe. Um, our experience involved a high level of victimization. Naturally, academics in Africa don't enjoy as much rights as academics in the developed world, and um, as a consequence, we have serious problems in, in terms of our salaries and in terms of our living conditions and all the things that matter that make us human. And um, our union, uh, some few years ago, embarked on a job action, which resulted in um, high-handed victimization by the government of Zimbabwe. Um, in our struggle, it was really some of the most basic rights that you could ever fight for, that is collective bargaining and uh, observance of ILO Convention 97 and 98. And um, in that process, because our education unions, by their very nature, are not uh, very big in terms of numbers, and uh, uh, in our, our kind of environment, it was very easy for our government to engage in bashing the union. It was very easy because they then embarked on wholesale transfers of our, our members to, from by distances of some 600 kilometers sometimes, separating academics from their families and, and, and all that. And our reaction, therefore, was to dig in and uh, fight on legally. But we also thought that the other way to fight was to lobby. Uh, and our lobbying efforts ended us in EI. That's why how we became uh, a member of EI. We were extensively writing to uh, anyone who would listen to our case. And uh, when we wrote to the Secretary General of EI, I know he doesn't know me, but uh, 
I do know him and I'm thankful. And uh, he, he then, of course, passed us on to David, who then, uh, of course, then took our case on and decided to help us through the Canadian Association of University Teachers. And um, I think the highlight of our collaboration was the signing of a uh, development cooperation agreement because part of the problem that we face is that we don't have the resources to face governments. And uh, we then put it to David that we, this is one of our challenges. Even our office was not adequate, adequately equipped enough to, 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 to then be able to mobilize our members and hit back. And uh, they supported us to equip our office, which was the beginning. And then eventually, we were able to get solidarity support with protest letters coming from universities that uh, through CAUT were mobilized to do so, writing to our minister, to our president. Uh, you know our president, who was recently dethroned as the ambassador of Wu. And then we, we were able to, in the end, uh, have our president remove the permanent secretary who had yeah, either to been the main player in the union bashing. So, uh, and, and we have done more. They have uh, other affiliates of EI, particularly NTEU, UCU, who are uh, here represented, um, Danish masters as well. They have supported our, our events, uh, our congresses, and I believe, therefore, that this recommendation can be made more meaningful and more visible if people engage more in solidarity work. And, uh, because in, in the end, with solidarity, it's always uh, the union uh, ethos that from each according to his ability and to each according to their need. And sometimes some of us find that we may have resources that we take for granted that may be useful to some people in a little way. So I think that's um, the experience. That's what I wanted to speak to. Because when you talk of the recommendation in Africa, you are talking about something that not very many people know to exist. But uh, I think uh, AI uh, should be in the forefront of promoting solidarity in order to make the recommendation more visible. The, that, those are my comments. Uh, and um, I, I believe that uh, the example that we have set with uh, CAUT can be replicated and uh, that more unions uh, that are, they are in need, uh, uh, equally in need, can be assisted. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, David. I think that's a good example of how we can use the principles of the recommendation if we work together, that on their own or on our own, it's often very difficult to, to achieve this. So perhaps I could invite uh, the panel to come up and join us now for a discussion. such a high-level group here uh, to uh, respond to uh, Nellie's report and uh, some of the issues that we've been talking about in terms of the, uh, of the recommendation. I won't, in won't introduce everybody individually. Uh, I think we'll just go through uh, directly into, see into, into some of the questions. But I want to talk, start with Mr. Tang, because uh, I know you have to leave a, a, a little bit earlier. But one of the things that Nellie points out in her study is just the general lack of awareness of the recommendation. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what UNESCO does 
to promote awareness and maybe what we could be doing more to help uh, member states, institutions, and uh, unions understand more about the awareness of this recommendation. George was there, and uh, no, we worked together for several years, uh, which a teacher is under his uh, division. Um, what I'd like to say is, um, now we, now we currently we do have a two, two uh, instruments. One is the 1966 uh, UNESCO ILO recommendation, and another one is this 97 uh, uh, recommendation concerning higher education teacher per teaching personnel. We want to put these uh, two. Uh, instrument um, complementing each other. So when we do the awareness, uh, uh, promotion awareness, we try to work together uh, with this two. Uh, basically, we're doing two, th three things. One is, is monitoring the implementation or awareness of the country in the member states. Another one is about advocacy uh, of the awareness and let the country knows, particularly the, the government. And the third thing we're doing is uh, capacity building for the government and also the teacher unions. And uh, you mentioned uh, in your report that this uh, uh, UNESCO ILO <coughs> committee of experts on the application of the recommendations. Uh, this, uh, this committee works for many years. Uh, of course, there's a lot of shortcomings you have mentioned there. But basically, we're using that uh, committee to do the, uh, like, a review the trends of the application of these uh, recommendations to member states. We collect the the report from member state to see which country is doing better, which country probably st still uh, need uh, uh, catch up. And also we make, uh, use this uh, committee's uh, work to make recommendations to UNESCO and ILO uh, during our general conference, for example, or during our executive board meeting uh, as a specific uh, topic for UNESCO and ILO to consider. Another thing uh, this uh, group is doing is a kind of mediation between the member states and their teacher unions. And as uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, member states, uh, the teacher unions, uh, sometimes they have a different uh, uh, um, recommendations or demands for the, member, for the government, and the government not necessarily to take. So UNESCO, are, so we are the intergovernmental organization. We try to help them to, uh, to, to mediate them. And of course, and then sometimes there's some uh, member states, uh, I guess, uh, uh, teachers union, they have some uh, allegations, uh, so some cases, uh, for the member states, for the government, and then they can submit it to UNESCO for UNESCO to, to review, and then to see what happened, and then make a recommendation to the authority of the government. And the the last thing is to say, say uh, every executive board of UNESCO, uh, we they exam the report of this committee uh, concerning the teaching uh, personnel issues. So this is another way to have the member states uh, uh, awareness uh, through this uh, mechanism. And of course, uh, I want to mention that uh, particularly the uh, another awareness is that this uh, every year, the, the 5th of October, we have an international or World Teachers' Day. We always organize this with ILO, with uh, Education International. The last one was in uh, October, uh, not long ago, in UNESCO, which is telecast uh, for, for many countries. I think this is another one way to make awareness of the importance of the teachers. Um, another thing I want to mention is uh, I think this is a successful story. Is uh, together with uh, Inter Education International and other uh, UN agencies, we made uh, when in the last two years uh, when we do the consultation on this uh, SDG number four, we successfully put the teachers as one of the target, which this is a, a big fight. I think I still remember we we fight together, uh, Education International and UNESCO, because we really believe uh, without the teachers, you cannot talk about education goals. Uh, the last thing I want to mention here is, um, I, I, I think this uh, recommendation, uh, David, you just mentioned there, it's quite important. Uh, you talk about um, um, maybe UNESCO and ILO should have a global dialogue, um, particularly on this uh, uh, academic freedom and also the uh, privatization of the higher education. I think these are two uh, very important issues in the member states today. It's sometimes controversial. But uh, they need, uh, I think if uh, UNESCO and ILO can organize some kind of global uh, dialogue, and then the country level also to help the country uh, and also the authority and also help the uh, teachers union 
to really have some consensus on these important issues. Another one, I think, recommendation I want to take from David's um, recommendation is that we should use uh, like an international teacher task force, which UNESCO and I, uh, uh, EI will also uh, together, and also we can use our national commissions. And today we have this uh, UNESCO chairs and uh, UNITWIN. This is another one. I don't believe in this UNESCO chairs. We do a lot of things on this, right? Uh, George, you 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 confirm that. Actually, we should probably add this uh, subject area into this UNESCO chairs and the unit trains program. So this is something uh, I think I, I take uh, as the recommendations uh, from uh, this report. So thank you so much for inviting me uh, for this. Um, now, uh, now for the moment, it's UNESCO general conference, like uh, as me, because they, they have all the minister of education come from 100 countries. So I always have a meetings every day. Today I'm gonna have 12 meetings, so I may have to go uh, I cannot stay too long here, but my colleagues uh, are, are here to continue. So then, uh, thank you so much for inviting me, uh, Fred. And uh, I have the last thing I want to say, uh, my personal uh, thanks to you and to Education International for all the support to me and also to UNESCO. And uh, so, you know, this is the last uh, year of the regime, the current regime of UNESCO. Our Director General is going to step down uh, in two weeks' time. And then, so there's going to be new regime in UNESCO. And I hope that the new regime uh, will continue to uh, put emphasis in education, particularly in the teachers. And um, I, I've been uh, Assistant Director General for Education for the last eight years. And I got a lot of su support and cooperation with Education International. I want to take this opportunity to thank, thank you, Fred, David, and Dennis for all the support I get and the cooperation I really enjoy the uh, cooperation between our two organizations. I, we ha I think we have done a lot of good things for the world, for the teachers. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, and thank you so much for your intervention. I appreciate it. it's extraordinarily a busy time for you, but we really appreciate the fact you took the uh, time to be here to talk about this very important uh, issue and this recommendation. Thank you. Uh, let me turn now to, to ask uh, some questions uh, to the International Labour Organization and perhaps to Monique as well as uh, the consultant and chair of the Global Campaign for Education. As I outlined, uh, uh, Nelly uh, uh, mentioned a, a couple of uh, uh, issues or new challenges that have emerged since the 97 recommendation first came into being. She, she talks a lot about the impact of austerity on the ability to deliver on the principles of the recommendation, the growth in casual precarious labor, uh, privatization. Uh, given those, those, uh, those challenges, to what extent do you think the, the current iteration of the 97 recommendation helps us address those challenges? And what are, the, in your view, the, main, the instrument's main principles and provisions for dealing with those particular challenges? So perhaps we'll start with uh, Cyril first, from the International Labour Organization. Yeah, merci, uh, merci beaucoup et, et merci aussi d'associer l'Organisation internationale du travail dans, dans, cette, uh, dans cet événement important. Uh, je, je commencerai par répondre à votre question uh, en, en soulignant que uh, ce que j'ai entendu, David, dans votre présentation du rapport, uh, ces transformations uh, du, uh, des conditions de travail dans le secteur de l'enseignement supérieur, pour moi, d'un point de vue plus global, du point de vue de l'OIT, ce sont des choses qu'on euh, entend assez souvent euh, s'agissant de transformations qui touchent en réalité l'ensemble du monde du, du travail. Donc, euh, encore une fois, les défis que ce secteur a affrontés ne sont pas sans lien avec les défis plus globaux que euh, le monde du travail aujourd'hui doit, euh, doit affronter, euh, qu'il s'agisse du développement de nouvelles formes d'emploi, d'emplois temporaires qui peuvent être source de précarité, euh, qu'il s'agisse des statuts autrefois rattachés au secteur public euh, qui sont euh, parfois en, en recul, euh, et puis euh, qu'il s'agisse aussi euh, de la réflexion sur le contenu du travail et sur l'équilibre entre euh, la liberté, l'autonomie dans les modalités du travail qui sont euh, aujourd'hui indispensable pour euh, encourager la création, l'innovation, et pas seulement dans le secteur de l'enseignement supérieur, mais aussi dans les entreprises du secteur privé. Donc cet équilibre entre autonomie, liberté du travailleur et 
euh, le contrôle et les obligations de, de reporting, encore une fois, ce sont des choses qui, euh, qui résonnent de façon beaucoup plus large dans l'ensemble du monde du travail. Alors, maintenant, qu est -ce, quel est le, le sens de l'engagement de, de l'OIT dans la mise en œuvre de cette recommandation euh, bien, Je dirais que, comme dans d'autres secteurs, ce, ce qui nous importe à l'OIT, c'est de prendre la mesure des spécificités euh, des conditions de travail dans l'enseignement supérieur pour pouvoir trouver les meilleures façons de rendre effectifs euh, les grands droits euh, fondamentaux du travail que sont euh, euh, l'interdiction des discriminations dans l'emploi, que sont les libertés syndicales, le droit à la négociation collective, euh, que sont aussi par exemple les protections qui sont nécessaires contre les ruptures de contrat ou les, lic les licenciements injustifiés. Donc notre travail et notre investissement dans dans la mise en œuvre et le contrôle de cette recommandation aux côtés de l'UNESCO, c'est bien de veiller à trouver les modalités, les modalités pertinentes dans le secteur de l'enseignement supérieur pour rendre effectifs ces droits et ces principes. Et je terminerai par un point qui me semble très important, c'est le mode de contrôle de cette recommandation. Alors, il y a sans doute beaucoup de choses perfectibles dans ce domaine, mais c'est ce qui détermine le crédit et l'indépendance dans la condition de mettre en œuvre cette, cette recommandation et je pense en particulier à ce comité d'experts de l'application des, des recommandations pour le personnel enseignant qui ressemble d'ailleurs un petit peu euh, au système de supervision des normes que l'on a à l'OIT et qui repose sur une commission d'experts indépendants des gouvernements euh, qui peuvent être saisis directement euh, de plainte par les, les acteurs euh, concernés. Je crois, Malik, les mêmes questions oui, merci. Euh, J'étais là à l'UNESCO le 11 novembre 1997 lorsque cette... Alors j'ai l'impression de parler un peu comme une ancienne combattante, comme on dit en France. Euh, mais et, et je me dis qu'en fait, je trouve que on a peu avancé. Peu avancé dans la connaissance de cette recommandation. C'est clair, c'est une des, je crois, ce qui ressort nettement au travers du, euh, du rapport que, que Nelly a fait. Et recherchant, dans, au cours des différentes conférences que nous avons organisées à l'International de l'Éducation tout au long des années 2000, on a fait ce constat et je retrouvais en particulier les interventions de Bill Ratry il y a plus de 15 ans, et qui étaient exactement les mêmes que ça. Euh, la, convention, la recommandation est pertinente, elle est toujours aussi pertinente aujourd'hui, elle est d'une actualité prodigieuse elle n'a pas pris une ride cette recommandation il faut s'en persuader et il faut que nous en particulier syndicalistes, nous nous en persuadions car c'est par ce biais là que nous arriverons à convaincre les agences les institutions de l'ONU les, euh, les gouvernements les institutions parce qu'écoutez, pour moi, et je vais y revenir à la fin de mes quelques minutes, euh, je pense que c'est l'élément fondamental qui manque actuellement dans notre réflexion sur ces questions. Alors, Nelly a identifié quelques, quelques points de, de, de défi. Austérité, liberté académique, augmentation du nombre d'enseignants à titre précaire, le développement de la privatisation... Toutes ces questions sont en fait très très liées, car c'est parce qu'il y a des politiques d'austérité que cela conduit pour une partie à la privatisation, qui conduit elle-même à précariser, à avoir inversé depuis 20 ans, et les résultats de Nelly renforcent encore cette, euh, je dirais ce, ces éléments, où on a inversé complètement, il y a 20 ans ou 30 ans, c'était les emplois à titre permanent, tenure, les emplois de titulaire qui prévalaient. Aujourd'hui, c'est le contraire. Donc, on a complètement euh, renversé cette, euh, cette situation. Et cette situation a des conséquences sur l'ensemble des questions. Elle a des conséquences sur les libertés académiques, car ils ont moins de liberté que les enseignants titulaires. Pour la plupart d'entre eux, ils ont une charge d'enseignement très importante qui ne leur permet pas de faire de la recherche. Or, Georges l'a dit dans son, dans son introduction, enseigner et chercher, ce sont, comme on pourrait dire en français, une mauvaise blague, les deux mamelles, ce sont les deux, on ne peut pas les diviser. La recherche irrigue, nourrit, euh, irrigue, comme tu l'as dit, Georges. Donc, euh, cette privatisation, cette austérité, 
elle a une, des conséquences très importantes justement sur l'exercice des libertés. Un autre aspect sur cette liberté de recherche, c'est ce que l'on voit aujourd'hui de plus en plus, la recherche, le financement par projet. Alors, ce n'est pas complètement illégitime, le, le, le financement par projet. Mais lorsque l'on tend dans un pays à avoir une recherche presque à 100% par projet, cela devient un véritable problème. Et où est la liberté des enseignants à des moments de, de, de choisir leur thème de recherche Parce qu'ils ont cette intuition que, eh bien, ce domaine-là, peut-être qu'ils vont se planter, on le sait. Mais je crois que ceci, cette austérité, précarisation, ce développement de la privatisation, et, et je crois que si on prend bien la peine de lire de manière approfondie et en notant, je ne vais pas vous refaire ça, je ne vais pas vous prendre la recommandation, mais euh, je l'ai relu très attentivement, et je me suis dit que sur toutes ces questions, on avait ici une base, une base pour, notamment les organisations syndicales, une base pour aller discuter, discuter avec les gouvernements, discuter avec les, les universités. Donc je pense qu'il y a beaucoup de choses à faire aujourd'hui. De mon point de vue, cette recommandation est toujours pertinente. Et il nous faut balayer d'un revers de main lorsque l'on nous dit « Oh, mais ce n'est qu'une recommandation, ce n'est pas un instrument contraignant. » Non, les États ont adopté, ont approuvé lors de la conférence générale il y a 20 ans, ce texte. Dommage que M. Tang soit disparu, mais Edem pourrait être... Parce que lorsque ce texte a été adopté il y a 20 ans, quatre gouvernements, quatre pays ont fait des réserves sur le chapitre 9, sur les conditions d'emploi. Or, ceci, j'ai recherché dans tous les documents depuis, ces réserves ont disparu de... de ça, donc, ce serait bien de savoir si c'est que ces États-là sont revenus sur leurs réserves ou si simplement, au cours des années, euh, il s'agitait des États-Unis, du Royaume-Uni, de l'Australie, et j'avoue ne plus me rappeler du, du quatrième sur le moment. Mais je crois, et je reviendrai tout à l'heure peut-être, parce qu'on parlera des stratégies, sur la responsabilité fondamentale des organisations syndicales sur la connaissance de cette recommandation. Thank you for weaving all those different issues together for us. I think it's also important to underline that the issue of precarity and casualization really strikes at the heart of the nature of our institutions because one of the values of the recommendation is it draws a link between the exercise of academic freedom and tenure or its functional equivalent. That tenure or its equivalent is the procedural mechanism that allows you to exercise your academic freedom. When you hire contract labor, you don't have that procedural protection anymore. And if academic freedom really is, as I think, the core value of universities and colleges, we are thereby not just treating people badly, which is a problem to begin with, but we're also undermining the core value of our institutions, and I think making universities and colleges much weaker for it. But uh, some, so, some of the other points that you raise are really important. One of the questions, of course, is why so many governments don't seem to be really aware of this or don't really seem to want to adopt the recommendation necessarily. But we're lucky to have with us uh, someone from the Committee of Experts, uh, Beatrice, who is here, who could talk a little bit maybe. If you could explain, Beatrice, uh, to, to what extent uh, the, or how, how the CR group works, to what extent it deals with the recommendation, and how do people make a complaint? What's, what's the procedure for, for going forward? Well, I'm very glad to be here. It's an opportunity to talk about the work of a group that I think remains maybe a little bit hidden from the views and from the understandings and perceptions of higher education personnel in many countries. The, uh, the group is formed by most, I think everybody that is a member of the group has experience or is a university teacher, has been uh, in, univer in higher education, involved in higher education. We work in two ways. Um, the, first of all, there are two topics. There's the topics that have to do with teachers, serving teachers in the education system, and the higher education uh, uh, personnel. The mode in which we work is to uh, consider important issues that are affecting uh, teacher, uh, higher education personnel and higher education in general, 
and that are being researched in, and uh, of where um, um, we try to get new knowledge about the problems but also about the possible ways of moving forward in relation to these problems. And that's why I would say that uh, an important part of the meeting is deals with background papers that have been commissioned before. I've been to three meetings of the CEART, and at each one of the meetings, we, um, after having had our usual discussions, we bring out problems or issues that would need further research. And so, for example, I'll just give you some example of the papers discussed. We had a very good paper on the quality of teaching in higher education and the effect of changes in the institutionalization of higher education. For example, growing privatization, casualty in the way uh, staff is contracted, um, in increase of student numbers beyond what uh, staff can manage. Uh, so that is one type of, of, of work that we've looked at. We also looked at concrete contractual conditions, and I'd say that the more recent paper and our more recent focus of attention has been on the professional, what we call professional development. Often personnel, higher education personnel doesn't want to talk about professional development. Somehow they think it belongs to teachers, but it doesn't. Uh, this professional development in improving your quality of what you do as researchers and improving the quality of how you work with your students. And so uh, we have been working on that. At the 2012 session, to give you just an example, we fo focused on the quality of higher education uh, uh, opportunities for improvement of its personnel. And then two background papers were part of the 2015 session on the professionalization of teaching and a UNESCO paper on the status of academic freedom. For the next session, which is next year, we will deal with something that's important. It's the ex assessment and evaluation of higher education personnel. This is a very important policy um, concern in many higher education institutions and in many states, how this is being done, what do we know in terms of research on it, and how can we deal also with another aspect of teaching that is what the teachers call pedagogic content knowledge, but it's the way in which you transform your substantive knowledge of a discipline into a teachable and learnable knowledge by students, university students. As to how, uh, the second part of the question is, how do we proceed with allegations? As you heard from the, from the report, Nelly Strompkis report, um, there seems to have been only two uh, submissions of uh, allegations to CRT. And in fact, I have been uh, part of meetings that have discussed these, one from Australian teachers and one from Denmark. And none of them have um, ended up in any real resolution. Partly because perhaps it has to do with the way we operate, but it's a way of operating that's very cautious about not uh, causing uh, disturbance that might s simply stop any, any procedure. So the first thing is, if there is an allegation to be made, it needs to be, needs to be related to the content of the uh, declaration. Now, the content is wide enough that I think any kind of situation dealing with a higher education personnel, you can find a reason, uh, I mean, you can find a, a justification for, for submitting an allegation if it's being violated. Uh, it, should, uh, Emmanuel, uh, uh, it should come from a uh, um, higher education teacher association. For example, you have one in Canada or several, in England or in other parts of the world, or an international one, which would be uh, concretely could be inter Education International. The CART Secretariat receives these, seeks for further information, uh, writes to those that are uh, submitting the allegation, and with all this information, this, it comes in a first instance to the CART meeting. If we don't have enough information, we will discuss it and we will request more. If we have already some sort of uh, uh, position regarding the allegation, we will go back to the government of the country or the authority of the country that is responsible for this for further information. Now, what happens is that these are long processes. It takes uh, approximately two years to process just the first part of it. And by the time you're waiting for a response of the government, a response that in one of the cases, at least in the end, no, 
There was no further responses, neither from the government nor from the uh, organization that had placed the allegation. It ends in nothing. So I would say that from that uh, point of view, perhaps CART has not had, up to now, uh, a much an, an important role in dealing with uh, uh, problematic situations of higher education personnel, and I think that has a lot to do with the way we publicize um, what we can do and how we get closer to university associations of teachers or uh, unions, and not every country has unions, there are different systems, but whatever. We need to do much more in that direction. Thank you, Patricia. That's very helpful. Uh, I, you raised the issue earlier about uh, assessment and evaluation. That's obviously something that's in the recommendation. There are procedures there. and it's, if, if you want to get uh, my members upset about anything, talk about parking and assessment and evaluation. That gets them really riled up. Uh, assessment and evaluation is becoming a hot topic because in many cases, in, in many countries, institutions are now relying upon external metrics to, to measure faculty performance, contrary to the traditional peer review process, which the recommendation focuses on. So it's a really interesting topic. I look forward to seeing the next report. Uh, before I open it up for general discussion, maybe just to go through the panel one more time and picking up on, on some of the issues about the frustration maybe <coughs> around the CART process is, maybe I could just ask each of you about uh, what, what two or three of the most important strategies you would think in your mind would be to, to develop, to implement, to ensure that the provisions of the recommendation are fully respected by governments and institutions. And maybe I can start with Edom from UNESCO first. Th thank you. Does this work? Thank you very much. Uh, to address your question directly, I think from the, from the report, one key conclusion is that the recommendation is not well known. So we cannot assess the implementation of something which people do not know about. So when Mr. Tang said that one of the strategies of UNESCO is to disseminate more the recommendation, I think it's the good starting point. Start letting people know about the recommendation. I can share my personal experience with you. I went to a country and I thought, as representing UNESCO teacher uh, program, one of the gifts I can give the minister was a copy of this recommendation. I walk into the office, I hand the document, and I say, keep away with that pamphlet that UNESCO and ILO have developed to support countries, uh, to support unions in their strikes against government. So that I was frozen by that, but I, I, keep my, I kept my calm and say, look, the recommendation talk about roles and responsibilities, both of the teacher and then the teacher employer. Gradually, I left the copy on the, on the desk of the minister, and later on, we had an activity in that country with teacher union representative and representative from the ministries of education, minister of labor, minister of finance. So the second thing I will say is that, talking about the work of the SEAD, one important recommendation I saw there is for the SEAD to meet more often. I don't know how this could be technically possible, but it's true that three years is too long for a committee to meet, follow up, and then revisit things and provide quick response to especially allegation. The third thing I will say is that there has been too much focus on allegation. And the instrument has been seen as an instrument to base allegations on. Whereas, if in the first place it is supported to be used and understood as a tool for facilitating social dialogue between teachers and their employers, maybe acceptance will be easier to get. The last World Teachers' Day that we celebrated, the theme was teaching in freedom, empowering teachers. Believe me, I received threats from government saying that, how could you say teaching in freedom? Are you promoting teachers' freedom to do anything with our kids? And I said, look, read the concept notes very carefully, and then you'll understand. After the, the, the World Teachers Day celebration, we have received other uh, uh, complaints saying, this speaker has spoken about my country criticizing the government doing this and that. So you see, 
when you put an instrument in the hands of intergovernmental organizations, we need the teacher union, we need the academics to support and then join hands, promoting at their levels before holding the decision makers and policy makers accountable for implementing something they have adopted. I'll stop there for the term on these three comments. Very helpful. I think uh, you pointed out one of the key struggles that we have is that the adoption of the principles uh, and their implementation we require the cooperation of unions, institutions, and governments. And sometimes we get governments who are maybe the maybe misunderstand or are openly hostile to some of the recommendations, and that's a big challenge going forward. But uh, perhaps, Monique, I could ask you, your, your important strategy, your strategies for seeing this instrument become implemented. Maybe just a little thing when Edem makes allusion to the menaces that they received. I remember always, ago, I don't mention the state in question, mais la dernière réunion de, de négociation et de finalisation du texte, où un État membre euh, s'est vraiment a dit qu'il était en désaccord avec un des articles sur les euh, l'article qui est dit que les, les enseignants ont droit au même droit civil euh, que les autres citoyens, et en disant ces gens-là veulent la liberté académique, mais, les libertés académiques, mais ils veulent aussi les mêmes libertés que les autres, les autres citoyens, et il était très offusqué que l'on puisse accorder aux enseignants ce, ce genre de... Et je crois qu'on en est toujours resté là, malheureusement, et il y a un verrou à faire sauter sur, sur ces questions. Alors, je crois que les stratégies, eh bien, je, je crois que le rapport de Nelly et ce que nous venons de dire est clair, cette recommandation n'est pas connue. Alors, je dirais, avant d'élaborer des stratégies pour savoir comment on va mettre en œuvre les dispositions de la recommandation, faisons d'abord, élaborons des stratégies pour permettre euh, qu'elles soient mieux connues, mais pas seulement mieux connues des gouvernements. Je le disais tout à l'heure, je crois que cette recommandation n'est pas connue non plus des universités, des institutions. Et je crois que c'est un chaînon manquant important euh, et il va falloir, et l'UNESCO a peut-être un rôle aussi à jouer là-dessus, car on évoquait euh, tout à l'heure, l'UNESCO est en partenariat avec un grand nombre d'organisations, l'IE est, est, un, est une de ces organisations de la société civile, mais à l'intérieur, il y a une association internationale des universités et il y a aussi toutes les associations régionales, hein, l'association européenne, les universités méditerranéennes, les universités africaines, le groupe latino. Je crois que il y a, euh, toutes ces organisations sont en partenariat officiel avec l'UNESCO, donc je crois que là aussi, l'UNESCO pourrait initier un dialogue. Tout à l'heure, M. Tang évoquait la médiation. Pourquoi ne pas évoquer, ne pas organiser un dialogue avec les institutions Car aujourd'hui, et encore plus dans le cadre de la privatisation, les institutions, les universités ont un, ont un rôle à jouer et sont en première ligne sur un certain nombre des questions qui sont évoquées ici. Donc je crois qu'il serait vraiment important qu'avec les institutions, mais aussi aujourd'hui, je crois qu'on doit aussi dialoguer davantage, même sur le contenu de cette recommandation, avec les étudiants. Je crois qu'eux aussi, aujourd'hui, il nous importe de chercher des alliés, des alliés dans, le, dans les universités. Donc, ce sont les universités elles-mêmes, ce sont les étudiants et leurs organisations. Droit, je crois qu'il est important que, à la fois pour l'international de l'éducation, mais il y a aussi une grosse responsabilité au niveau euh, régional, mais au niveau national. Moi, je vois bien, je suis française. <rire> euh, je ne pense pas que les organisations syndicales françaises, j'en suis même sûre, aient fait depuis 20 ans de gros efforts... Euh, pour faire connaître, alors probablement parce qu'on estime que dans un certain nombre de pays que le statut des enseignants, ben, ce qui est dit dans cette recommandation, on n'en a pas besoin. Je crois que ce n'est pas vrai, ce n'est pas vrai. Donc je pense que, et aussi, je dirais la dernière stratégie en tant que rôle de nos organisations, c'est un peu ce que notre collègue David a dit tout à l'heure du Zimbabwe, la solidarité 
la complémentarité entre nous. Il faut absolument que ceux qui ont une expérience, certaines organisations, vous au Canada, euh, vous êtes un des rares pays euh, au Royaume-Uni, où vous avez su utiliser la recommandation au niveau des négociations collectives. Mais très, très peu de pays ont réussi à, à l'utiliser de cette manière. Donc, je crois qu'il faut aussi utiliser les bonnes pratiques pour mieux les faire connaître à l'intérieur du mouvement syndical, afin que d'autres, alors bien sûr, rien n'est transposable en tant que tel, mais chacun peut adapter, se saisir des bonnes pratiques pour ensuite mettre en œuvre un certain nombre de, de ces conditions. Donc, chercher des alliés, euh, mieux, mieux faire connaître la recommandation, se chercher des alliés, plus de solidarité, de complémentarité au niveau, au niveau des organisations syndicales. A, uh, a Cyril, from the point of view of the ILO, what do, what do you think has to be done to uh, ensure that the recommendation is more fully implemented? I think what I'm going to say is largely convergent with what the other members of the panel have said to us, and I'm going to say je le dis avec beaucoup de modestie parce que je ne suis pas un expert euh, du, du domaine de l'enseignement supérieur. Mais moi, il y a une première chose qui me semble très importante, c'est encore une fois d'insister sur le rôle de ce comité euh, des experts pour l'application des recommandations euh, pour le personnel enseignant, euh, parce que c'est véritablement ce qui donne du crédit euh, à la mise en œuvre d'un instrument de, de ce type. Et si je compare avec euh, la façon dont... Euh, l'ensemble des normes internationales de l'OIT sont contrôlées. Encore une fois, euh, on a une structure un peu équivalente, hein, le, le, un, un comité d'experts indépendants qui est la clé de voûte du système de contrôle de l'application des normes internationales. Et le succès du système de supervision des normes de l'OIT, c'est trois choses, en fait. Hein. La première, c'est euh, l'indépendance et la qualité de l'expertise au sein de cette commission, qui est quelque chose qui est vraiment essentiel et je crois que cette commission euh, euh, répond à tous, ces, à tous ces critères. La deuxième chose, euh, c'est euh, l'implication euh, de tous les acteurs concernés. L'OIT est une organisation tripartite, à la différence d'autres organisations internationales comme UNESCO. Ça veut dire quoi, tripartite Ça veut dire qu'il n'y a pas que les gouvernements qui sont membres de l'organisation, sont membres de l'organisation également les représentants des syndicats de travailleurs et des organisations professionnelles. Et c'est cette gouvernance tripartite qui fait fonctionner ce système de supervision des normes. Chaque année, sur la base des rapports euh, des experts, il y a un certain nombre de cas, d'allégations qui sont examinés de façon tripartite. Et c'est ce qui, à mon avis, est la deuxième condition de succès de ce système. Et, et donc, encore une fois, c'est l'implication des acteurs qui, qui, qui est gage de, de, de réussite. Et puis, le troisième point, euh, c'est la transparence des débats, c'est la publicité des débats. Euh, les organisations internationales, on n'a pas, pas toujours de, 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 de juge ou de corps de contrôle à disposition. Euh, la force que l'on peut avoir, c'est la, la, la force du verbe euh, rendu publiquement devant l'ensemble des acteurs concernés. Et cette publicité des débats euh, dans le fonctionnement du système de supervision des normes à l'OIT est quelque chose de très important. Le deuxième point, ça a été dit euh, notamment par Nam Fouillou, je crois que c'est l'amélioration, tout ce qu'on peut imaginer en termes d'amélioration du plaidoyer de la communication autour de, de cette recommandation. Mais là encore, euh, ça dépend un petit peu de la façon dont les acteurs concernés se saisissent euh, de ces instruments. Ce n'est pas euh, l'UNESCO ou l'OIT qui, comme ça, peuvent euh, rendre euh, euh, universelle la connaissance de tel ou tel instrument. C'est la façon dont les acteurs au niveau national peuvent se saisir de ces instruments dans leur stratégie revendicative euh, du, du quotidien, si, si je puis dire. Euh, puis le troisième point que, que je voudrais citer, c'est le, le rôle du dialogue social. Donc, bon, comme vous avez compris, c'est un point qui est important du point de vue de l'OIT. Ça rejoint une des recommandations que vous avez mentionnées, cette idée de euh, « global dialogue euh, ». Nous, on dirait « dialogue social ». Alors, dans le domaine de l'enseignement supérieur, comme dans d'autres d'ailleurs, euh, il y a sans doute un certain nombre de difficultés euh, à, à lever, parce que pour que le dialogue social, ça fonctionne, il faut avoir des représentations collectives pour le faire vivre. Et il faut que ça repose aussi sur une véritable culture des acteurs sociaux. Or, dans le secteur de l'enseignement supérieur, comme dans d'autres secteurs, encore une fois, on a du côté des employeurs, par exemple, affaire à des, 
dans beaucoup de pays, à, à un secteur extrêmement éclaté, avec de multiples établissements, de statuts différents, qui vont du secteur public jusqu'au secteur commercial lucratif. Et on n'a pas toujours d'interlocuteurs constitués pour porter une parole des employeurs en tant que tels de l'enseignement supérieur. Et puis, euh, du côté des, des syndicats de, de salariés, encore une fois, là, je m'avance avec beaucoup de, mauvaise, de modestie, euh, mais euh, c'est vrai que euh, euh, le dialogue social ne peut marcher que par euh, euh, un très fort investissement dans des engagements solidaires, collectifs, qui parfois euh, se heurtent à des cultures plus individualistes. Et donc, il faut être capable de porter des intérêts par-delà les questions de statut, d'ancienneté ou d'âge, parce que euh, les mauvaises conditions de travail euh, des uns ne, ne, ne font jamais la, les bonnes conditions de travail des autres. Euh, ces mauvaises conditions de travail, elles portent véritablement atteinte à l'intégrité et à la qualité académique de, de tous. Voilà, voilà ce que je pouvais vous dire. Merci. Thank you, sir. Uh, and finally, uh, Beatrice, uh, what strategies would you recommend uh, to ensure that the uh, principles of the recommendation are respected? Okay, I, I, when I was thinking, because we received uh, uh, an idea of what we would be asked, thinking about strategies, I thought rather about problem areas that would need perhaps a strategy to be dealt with. Um, and I thought of three that have to do with higher education, and I think that they affect especially uh, the less developed or poorer countries or very mixed in terms of population. One of them is what I call equity is issues. The second one has to do, I think, with the presentation that we heard from Director Haddad on the tensions between research and teaching. And the third one, <laughs> quality assurance principles. Uh, how, how do we handle this issue of evaluation and all that? So on equity, I think uh, in, in all, all higher education institutions today, but more so in some of them, there are problems with equity in terms of access, in terms of the opportunities, for example, of a relatively equal male-female participation in higher education teaching and research. Also, participation in terms of economic or racial origins, social origins, or even personnel with special needs. I, re I will never forget my, my teacher, best teacher I had of philosophy when I was doing my PhD, who came to classes in a wheelchair. And everything was arranged in the university for that to happen. In many countries, that doesn't happen easily. It is not easy for a person with uh, such handicaps to part, be part. We need to know then more about how equity is furthered in, in different or not furthered in different geographical contexts. And my suggestion here would be to carry out a review, of in, an initial review of existing studies in higher education, equity-related issues, and on that basis perhaps have a series of workshops in geographical context, maybe it's only one, but even if it is only one, in different geographical contexts where there is such problems, either racial se segregation, female, male, whatever, for example, Central America, Oceania, Southern Africa, even Northern Canada, I think. In these contexts, the mixes of types of populations are important, and the opportunities for persons with different conditions to be part of the academic bodies of higher education might or not be equitable. The second area that I wanted to touch on was the, what I call tensions between research and teaching. Often these tensions are noticeable in institutions that don't have sufficient personnel on long-term contracts or with an adequate ratio of teaching and non-teaching hours. Often, in, ca in the case of teacher education programs, where the, co the commitment to preparing teachers doesn't leave time or, or opportunity for research. And, uh, there is a, and also in technical e education, higher education institutions. I think in this respect, the, the Stromquist uh, report highlights a growing tendency today to determine a higher education quality in terms of uh, publications in certain types of journals um, that are in some very high, highly respected 
um, index, most of which are in English. And this shuts out a lot of people in different parts of the world from being able to publish and communicate their results, even communicate their results in their own context. In my country, it is more important to publish in a, in a faraway journal than to write for the Chileans that need to learn about what we are doing and, and, and what we, we can offer for improvement of the education system. So while it is appropriate to validate the notion of teaching as fed by research and the importance of ensuring preparation for higher education teaching that goes beyond a first degree, the scope and mode of doing research, I think, differs according to fields of specialization. And whether such research is intended or not as a means of impacting on social activities, culture, science, and technology. Thus, a second strategy, my second strategy, would be to organize an international colloquium. But as we were he uh, talking, uh, there was a mention of the UNESCO chairs. And I just want to say that the UNESCO chair can be a form of bringing together uh, different countries. I, well, I am part of a, uh, my institution is part, or my program is part of a UNESCO chair in South Africa. And we have collaborated in producing research, in, in reading uh, mutually our work, and in growing that way. So I think that is one form, but colloquia on the different forms of linking research to teaching and of communicating research results. I think that without disregarding the classic high-ranking research publication, I'm not saying we're not supposed to do it, we should look for quality criteria that is equally important, important as evidence of academic and professional quality in higher education teaching. And the third area has to do with quality assurance. This is something important. Uh, a lot of higher education personnel resist it because of the form in which the principles of higher education uh, quality assurance are implemented. I think quality assurance covers the conditions for and the verification of quality in academic and educational performance. The declaration uh, uh, sets out an ample list of elements belonging to quality assurance that are the responsibility of higher education systems and that need to be taken seriously. However, even though in this declaration it is not said specifically what kind of system would be a good system, I think that it implicitly it is said that a system in higher education, in higher education quality assurance, needs to be agreed by all higher education bodies. It needs to be agreed by the community of university or uh, higher education institution personnel. And they should be defining what is to be required in terms of quality and how it will be verified. The state also has a part in this, especially when the state is financing higher education. And so obviously it needs to probably manage or, uh, or and certainly uh, help to fund the system. However, more and more accountability is established and verified in many countries through external institutions and mechanisms which may originally have resulted from consultation, but which in fact operate without a sufficient revisiting of those principles, those originally maybe agreed about principles. So a strategy here, in my view, would be to produce knowledge about the concepts of higher education quality that form part of a national or local system of quality assurance. And we could select a group of key countries or states within countries with different kinds of quality assurance systems functioning and do case studies on these. The parameters one could look at it are the following. How did the system originate? What participation was there at higher education authority, of unions, of university staff organizations? What impact of international models of quality assurance exists in these national systems? I know because our system, when it was created, looked very much towards the American, the US systems. Main components, what components would it have? How is the evaluation process to be carried out? The importance of peer review, basically a peer system. What type of criteria to evaluate? Who formulates the criteria? How is it formulated? How is it agreed about? 
and what effects are expected on institutional quality, but also what effects might not be good on institutional quality, such as further stratification of the higher education system or student stratification. You only choose the best, always the best according to certain parameters without looking for the best according to other parameters. Impact on teaching, on research, and on individuals within institutions, as well as other possible emerging effects that one could visualize in doing these key case studies. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Beatrice. Uh, lots for us to digest, maybe even some provocative uh, comments uh, towards the end. Uh, you've listened patiently, now it's your turn. Any uh, questions? And could I ask, uh, I assume there's a microphone going around, uh, if you could speak in the microphone for translation purposes and just briefly introduce yourself. And there's a question right here. Great, Graham McCulloch, General Secretary, National Tertiary Education Union Australia. Uh, if you don't mind, David, I wanted to make a couple of comments and then invite perhaps the panel after some others uh, have, have spoken. David, you posed the question and the panellists have uh, asked, is the recommendation still relevant 20 years later, particularly having regard to casualisation and austerity? I think the simple answer to that is yes. Um, five things jump out at me. Institutional autonomy the need for adequate funding, tenure or its functional equivalent, the importance of academic freedom and the importance of institutional accountability, they're universal principles which can still be used to deal with those questions. Secondly, from the point of view of the unions, it still remains highly relevant because we can use that instrument at a domestic level to defend our profession to defend our employment conditions, to assist us in our bargaining processes, and to assist us in our public policy uh, interventions. As one of the only two unions that have actually lodged uh, under the existing uh, instrument, I think all of the comments from the panellists are, are correct. I would just add two other quick things. However it is done, the CR process needs to be more speedy but I'd also remind people you don't just have to rely on CR, depending on the nature of what's going on. You can also rely on the ILO conventions um, as part of that process. And in practice, the use of CR is still very helpful at a domestic level. In the case of our complaint, although we would have preferred the processes were much speedier, it was of great assistance to us in our domestic context and I strongly agree with the views expressed about making the recommendation more visible, but that lies within the grip of the individual domestic unions as well as EI, uh, and we've been able to use that instrument to also get really good language in our collective agreements around academic freedom and other things. I just wanted to conclude with a, in the spirit of good academic dialogue, uh, a limited criticism of Nellie's report, although it does deal with all of those things that I've just referred to very positively. And my simple comment would be this. We need to understand that these universal principles apply in diverse contexts. And reading Nellie's report and some of the other stuff that we've produced, it doesn't properly reflect the diversity of systems across the world. It's very much in the North American liberal tradition, which is fine, the Commonwealth and English model is not quite the same. The Habsburg model and the post in Central and Eastern Europe is different again. And really, we all agree that universities exist within and between civil society and the state, but the balance between the state and civil society in any given national context is quite different. So you can also have collectivist views of academic freedom as well as individual views of academic freedom. And finally, in that context, the other thing I think that is not properly reflected in the report is the diversity of the institutions themselves. There's more than 3,000 higher education institutions in the world and 1,750 universities. Only about 800 of those are based on the premise of the unity of teaching and research, which originally came from the Humboldt model and then went through to North America, didn't even arrive at Oxford and Cambridge until after World War II. We're talking about 2,000 institutions that are principally founded on a teaching role. Now here's the important point, it's my last point, to unify those positions, but 
we need to be conscious of these distinctions, there are functional equivalents of research in those teaching-focused universities. Scholarship and professional currency. But they're not the same as research, and we need to be clear, if we're going to be effective globally, we need to actually understand those diversities. And while Nelly's report is an excellent report, I don't think it reflects that diversity, and I'd be interested to hear from others about their experiences on the balance of teaching and research. Thanks, Graham. Maybe before I go back to the panel, I'll see if there's any other questions uh, from the audience. Merci. Merci, Monsieur le Président. C'est Asibina Poué du Bureau Régional de l'International de l'Éducation pour la région Afrique. Euh, nous tenons à remercier tous les panélistes. Nelly n'est pas présente mais nous lui adressons nos félicitations parce qu'elle a réellement mis le doigt sur les problèmes actuels. Certes, mon collègue du Zimbabwe est intervenu pour l'Afrique, mais nous voudrions insister sur, disons, trois points en Afrique. Il y a d'abord le non-respect des libertés académiques, ça c'est sur toute la région Afrique. Euh, je dirais un peu de l'équivalence qui entraîne l'absence de mobilité du personnel. Il faudrait qu'on parle aussi un peu de cette équivalence euh, au niveau de la région et essayer de résoudre le problème de mobilité Là, j'avais dit trois points, finalement, ça fait quatre. Il y a le problème de privatisation à outrance. La privatisation, elle est plus forte dans l'enseignement supérieur même que dans l'enseignement pré-universitaire. Et enfin, le dialogue social. Je voudrais, disons, faire appel à l'UNESCO à travers euh, EDEM, puisque le directeur adjoint est parti, de se saisir de l'opportunité de ce 20e anniversaire de la recommandation pour en appeler aux ministres qui sont présents ici, aux représentants des États, des gouvernements, pour institutionnaliser le dialogue social. Euh, le re représentant de l'Organisation internationale du travail l'a souligné, ce n'est que par ce dialogue que nous pouvons arriver au respect des différentes recommandations. Bien sûr, il faut vulgariser, même celle de, qui a déjà 50 ans, de 1966, n'est même pas connue par certains de nos États, les officiels. Donc, quand on veut se servir de ces instruments, il faut qu'ils le connaissent. Il faut que nous-mêmes, comme syndicalistes, comme nous ayons des outils appropriés, là également je reviens au, à l'OIT, pour nous aider à nous en approprier. Et ensuite, faire savoir aux gouvernants que les recommandations ne sont pas uniquement en faveur des travailleurs, des enseignants, puisque dans ces recommandations, il y a les obligations, nos droits, il y a les obligations des enseignants, et après, nous avons nos droits. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, Chair. My name is Yumiko. Um, I work for UNESCO Institute for International Capacity Building in Africa. We work on teachers' capacity development. We have been working with, in, we are based in Addis Ababa. We have been working with uh, St. Mary's University, which is a local university in Ethiopia, but they have been running international conference on private universities. And as many of you know, National universities cannot meet the demand, increasing demand for tertiary education in many countries in Africa, and yet those universities 
often have a ver uh, not very high quality education, and these lecturers at private universities are considered second class uh, teachers, and yet they are doing a heroic work and in um, bringing like mid-career uh, university and graduate studies for working um, urban, urban young people and so on. S but they just don't have uh, any time for research or their own professional development. And I was just wondering, when we talk about the higher education teaching a personnel, I suppose you are, we are looking at the both national and the private. In, in the 20 years from now, probably there will be a lot more uh, private universities, and yet these are not Harvard or Yale. In some countries, private universities have much higher quality, but in, uh, in some other countries, they are not. Thank you. There's a question up front there. Rob? Um, Rob Copeland from the UCU uh, UK. Um, I would just like to echo the uh, comments people made about the growth of kind of teaching focused institutions but also careers as well. I, I think that is very much a, um, a big change since the, the kind of 97 recommendation, not just with private providers but also actually within existing so called public institutions. But what I wanted to say was something about the relationship between institutional autonomy and, and academic freedom, which is obviously a key part of the UNESCO recommendation. And as it says, the proper enjoyment of academic freedom, et cetera, requires the autonomy of higher education institutions. And that's absolutely right. But also, I think there's a tendency to sometimes conflate the two. Certainly, we find amongst uh, heads of institutions that they're very strong on the protection of autonomy, but are much weaker or much more nebulous about the, the definition of academic freedom. And I'll just give you an example from my own jurisdiction, the UK. We come out very highly on the European Universities Association autonomy scorecard, very highly, one of the best in Europe, partly for issues to do with organisational autonomy or, or staffing autonomy, as well as academic autonomy. But a recent research project we did looking at academic freedom shows that the, we have very weak protections of academic freedom, um, both in a kind of constitutional sense, but also a legal sense, but also because of issues to do with casualization and, uh, and weak governance. So I suppose my point is we need to think about the relationship between the two um, because actually there's a tendency to conflate flate the terms. Uh, I'll be just interested in your thoughts on, 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 that, on that issue. Thanks, Rob. Any other questions before I go back to the panel on institutional autonomy? I think the, the, the recommendation tries to finesse it a little bit by recognizing that institutional autonomy is necessary to protect academic freedom from external actors, from state or outside sources, but also it can be used uh, internally as an assault. So we have to be careful, and certainly in the U.S. context, I don't want to digress too much, uh, a lot of court decisions now around academic freedom conflate academic freedom solely with institutional autonomy, which I think is a real problem. Uh, one final question up front, and then we'll go back to the panel. En espanol? For, to work out translation, sorry. Okay. Me tocó participar en la discusión o en la asamblea eh, que se estableció convocada por la IE cuando se instaló el Consejo General de la ONU y se hizo una revisión de la recomendación que hizo, se hizo en 1966 para el oh, trabajo docente. No, okay. Tuve la oportunidad de participar 
en la reunión que se convocó antes de que se instalara el Consejo General de la ONU y se pudiera revisar en el marco de, las, de los 50 años de la recomendación de 1966 para el trabajo docente. Y hay muchas similitudes respecto de esta reunión. Ambas eh, recomendaciones son vigentes casi en su totalidad para todos los países. El problema es que tienen un carácter no vinculatorio y que los gobiernos, como actos de buena voluntad, manifiestan los gobiernos parte la aceptación de las recomendaciones. Pero cuando regresan a los países de origen, la realidad lo rebasa. Y este carácter no vinculatorio de ambas recomendaciones nos afecta a todos. Y creo que todos los que estamos aquí debemos de asumir tareas para lograr un cambio en, esas, en esa visión. Primero, para los sindicatos tenemos la obligación de difundir, como aquí ya se ha dicho, de difundir ambas recomendaciones. Segundo, creo que debe de haber una adecuada cooperación institucional entre UNESCO y OIT, porque hay una desvinculación. Si bien es cierto, hay tratados internacionales en materia de derecho laboral, la mayoría de los que tienen que ver con trabajo docente está encasillado en las recomendaciones que tienen que ver con burócratas y necesitamos que estas recomendaciones sean específicas para el trabajo docente. Requerimos estar vinculados y quizá eh, adoptar un elemento de la OIT, que es el debate público y al mismo tiempo el tripartismo, que nos permita incidir a los docentes en estas recomendaciones, porque como bien lo dijo el representante de la OIT, todo este trabajo tiene una implicación desde el punto de vista del derecho laboral. La flexiseguridad, los derechos laborales, la certeza jurídica, el trabajo digno, el trabajo decente, la estabilidad laboral. Y necesitamos crear una vinculación, porque mientras no se pague el trabajo de investigación a nuestros docentes de educación superior, será muy difícil que la educación superior rebase las expectativas que hoy tenemos en esta mesa. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Uh, lots there. Let me give the last word to the panel. Lots to chew on there. Some questions about uh, the diversity of systems. How does the recommendation, how, how it can be used or maybe needs to be changed to deal with some of the diversity, not just in, the, in systems, but also within institutions. We heard about specific uh, issues in Africa, a general non-respect for academic freedom, lack of social dialogue, increasing privatization was a theme that was raised also by our colleague uh, from UNESCO. Uh, questions around institutional autonomy. And finally, I guess one of the big questions is how do we give this recommendation more teeth? How do we make sure it actually means something and can be used uh, to promote and protect uh, uh, things like academic freedom and collegial governance and, and uh, the important nature of uh, academic work. So with that, I'll give the panelists one minute each to answer all those questions. Well, actually, you can take, you take one of those. <laughs> uh, I'll start at the far end with uh, Monique. Mon Dieu. <laughs> Une minute. Bon, je crois que, oui, c'est très facile, effectivement. Euh, je crois, je voudrais rebondir sur ce qui a été dit à la fois par Graham et par, et par Rob, parce que tout à l'heure, j'évoquais dans mes stratégies la nécessité de se tourner davantage vers les institutions. Et je crois que ça permettrait aussi de mettre sur la table les points que, que vous évoquiez, euh, effectivement, parce que la question des libertés est souvent mise en avant par les, pour l'autonomie des établissements. Et, et je crois qu'il serait euh, la, ce, ce lien davantage, ce, ce dialogue avec les, les institutions permettrait, je pense, de mettre sur la table un certain nombre des, des questions qui viennent d'être soulevées. Hein. Et euh, je pense que, deuxième point, je le disais, il y a eu quelques expériences, quelques bonnes pratiques faites par certaines de nos organisations, 
Hein Certaines ont été évoquées, l'Australie, même le Royaume-Uni. Enfin, je pense qu'on devrait se servir de cela, justement, en disséminant davantage et en faisant mieux connaître la recommandation, comment cette recommandation a été utilisée, diffusée ces bonnes pratiques en même temps, et peut-être en même temps aussi le, le rôle du CERT. Alors j'allais dire, peut-être que je me dis, ben, non, si le, le CERT n'est pas utilisé, c'est que la recommandation sera mieux connue, mais je crois que justement, si on montrait que le CERT a un rôle à jouer plus important, et il pourrait jouer justement un rôle plus, plus important dans, dans cela. Mais je crois que ce, ce dialogue avec les institutions permettrait de mettre sur la table un certain nombre des, des défis auxquels les, les personnels sont confrontés aujourd'hui. Merci. Euh, ra rapidement, peut-être deux remarques complémentaires par rapport aux questions qui viennent d'être soulevées. Euh, la, la première sur euh, la, la difficulté de prendre en compte la, la diversité hein, des situations euh, dans les différents pays. Euh, je crois que, bien sûr, que les situations sont très diverses, mais il me semble qu'il y a un, un point commun à, à toutes les régions du monde, c'est euh, le très fort besoin euh, en matière de formation, le très fort besoin de personnel euh, dans le secteur de l'enseignement supérieur. Ça, ça concerne les pays en développement, ça concerne les pays émergents, ça concerne les pays industrialisés, ça concerne tout le monde. Et je crois que si on ne pourra relever cet enjeu partout dans le monde, que si justement on apporte la démonstration de l'efficacité du dialogue social et pas seulement d'un dialogue social conçu pour régler des conflits mais aussi d'un dialogue social conçu pour créer des consensus et y compris des consensus internationaux je crois que c'est très important et, et, et la recommandation si on sait s'en saisir cette fameuse recommandation elle peut, elle peut sans doute aussi contribuer, contribuer à ça euh, on ne pourra pas attirer les meilleurs talents, on ne pourra pas attirer les jeunes dans ces professions, surtout dans les pays où on en a le plus besoin, euh, sans investir aussi dans la qualité de l'emploi et le respect des, des prérequis en matière de, de recherche qu'on a cité, la liberté académique en, en particulier. Et puis la deuxième remarque, en écho notamment à la, la dernière question qui a été posée, pour souligner que du point de vue de l'OIT, euh, les, les travailleurs de l'enseignement supérieur, ce sont aussi des travailleurs comme les autres, et par conséquent que... Euh, L'ensemble des garanties qui sont prévues par les conventions internationales de l'OIT, évidemment, ont vocation à s'appliquer à ces catégories dans les pays qui les ont ratifiées. Mais euh, je crois que beaucoup de pays d'Amérique latine, en particulier, ont beaucoup ratifié les conventions de, de l'OIT. Et évidemment, tous les mécanismes de contrôle que j'ai très rapidement évoqués sont tout à fait mobilisables dans, dans, ce, dans ce secteur et alimentent le dialogue tripartite que l'on peut avoir au niveau de l'Organisation internationale du travail. Um, well, I would <laughs> like to start with also with the uh, first question on institutional diversity. Uh, I think that was the reason I was proposing to look at the diversity, exactly the diversity. There is diversity, geographical diversity, but also is diversity within similar contexts of higher education institutions. However, that diversity is uh, hidden often because there's a, a, a sort of more universal model that is imposed or that is preached, let's put it that way, over higher education. And so what you look for is that that small college that operates okay, that is teaching, that is producing, uh, look like a big university with research, with, with everything that has to go, go into it. So we need, um, and t that's one point, um, but other, the other, there's other ones that link in. The privatization is similar because the, the, it, is the pri it is private ownership of uh, higher education institutions that is generally uh, ownership of the more precarious institutions. At least that's the experience that I've seen. There, there are big international groups that are own universities in several countries, as you probably know, Uh, and those big international groups have a lot of funds, and they are very, very difficult to, for example, to uh, penetrate, especially in how much profit there is made by those kinds of institutions. And in those kinds of institutions, the, the, the status of personnel is quite pre precarious often. Um, so we have, I think, It, these, issue, these are huge issues, and they're important issues, 
And the discussion needs to go beyond just the small union of teachers, university teachers. That union has to bring the discussion to the open. It needs to be written. It, it is happening. And I think, uh, for example, Nelly Stromkis, even though it has those limitations that you were saying about diversity of institutions, does highlight many of those issues. And those need to be discussed because in the end, the solution, I think, is going to have to come from the educational system, the government edu educational systems. And you need to be able to penetrate that. We had students screaming in the streets for over, um, I say, two governments to get free tuition in higher education so that they wouldn't be lumbered with horrible debts for the rest of their life. That did produce an effect. The, the change is happening. But uh, so maybe uh, it's not just the students, but we need to have much more open um, discussion and open presentation. And facts, I think, are important. Research is important because it's a way of, let's say, hopefully, influencing what is called evidence-based policy. So um, I think that's what I will say. Thank you, Beatrice. And finally, the last word to Idem from UNESCO. Well, thank you. And thank you for your, your input and contributions. I think one thing I can say is I'm going, to, I'm going away with uh, the recommendations about what UNESCO should do better. But I would say that it's going to be a two-way intervention. Two ways, because if these recommendations had been known as we wish, the SIAT will not be able to handle all the allegations we'll be receiving, to be sure. We mentioned a handful of allegations that were submitted, and we have not been able to, to treat them properly. It means that the mechanism put in place to monitor the, the recommendation need to be made more efficient and effective. And then we'll work on that, starting with the next SEAT meeting that will take place in Geneva next year. The second thing is to look at, to make use of UNESCO's leverage to do more work with the unions, with the academic institutions, with the international organizations. And one example, I want to finish on a positive note. One example of a good initiative that we are engaged with ILO, UNICEF, the World Bank, GPE, Education International, and the Teacher Task Force, UNHCR, is to implement a project on supporting four countries to develop their teacher, to improve their teacher policies. In doing that, each of these partners is coming with their comparative advantage. And I'm sure EI will be strong on promoting social dialogue using the instrument that exists today. ILO will come with the same position and strengthening the country's position in doing that with all the stakeholders that will be participating at country level. UNESCO will come with the teacher training and the teacher education using ICBA, for example, and also promoting that. The World Bank will come with the financing of the teaching force. So all these partners will bring in their comparative advantage to deliver something. And in doing that, we will say, what are the guidelines or what are the documents we have available talking globally about teacher issues? And the recommendation is going to be looked up as one element. I also want to see the globality of the challenge. One thing I thought will come out here, which I didn't hear luckily, is there is in UK an, a member of parliament who sent letters to uh, universities <laughs> asking them to report on how they are teaching the Brexit. So th we, we've been receiving a lot of uh, concern <laughs> about, OK, is this against academic freedom and then uh, uh, universities' autonomy? These examples show that the problem is global. The problem is global, but we shouldn't allow the countries where even these privileges are not entertained. I mean the countries of the South, because the allegations we mentioned are from countries like Japan, uh, Denmark, where you know most of the countries in the South will say teachers are in paradise. So the countries where every day's performance is already a breach of this recommendation we need to support them to understand what their rights are, how they could uh, support themselves to claim it better, 
and then work with uh, their colleagues in other geographic zones to improve the teachers' condition. So last word, I'm going away with the recommendation that UNESCO need to do faster and better what it's supposed to do with ILO to implement and monitor this recommendation, making them known better. The two celebrations, last year, 50th anniversary, this year, 20th anniversary, are wake up calls for us all that we have good documents in our hands that we hardly have tapped into. I thank you for this opportunity. And I uh, look forward to working with you all on uh, uh, implementing some of the recommendations that come off of this rich report. Thank you. That, that ends things on a very positive and forward-looking note, and I hope that we can follow up on that. And when we meet again to celebrate the 25th anniversary, we're going to have more good news. But I do take the point that uh, this is a global issue, that uh, if we look at all the violations of academic freedom or trade union rights or collegial governance around the world, it would be a lot of work for Beatrice and, and her colleagues. And uh, certainly, uh, you mentioned the uh, Brexit case. Uh, I come from Canada. We have a next door neighbor that I could spend the next two or three hours <laughs> telling you about some of the issues, but I won't mention who that neighbor is. Uh, I'm very diplomatic. Uh, I have a couple, I, I just want us to please join me in thanking the uh, panelists uh, for their wonderful contributions. I also have a, a couple of uh, quick announcements to make. Uh, one is uh, for those of you who are attending, the General Conference of UNESCO. There is a briefing uh, tomorrow morning at the UNESCO offices, room 2002, 2002 at 9 o'clock. So those of you who are attending, uh, please go to the briefing room at that point. Uh, we also, I have the great pleasure now to invite you to a reception on the third floor. I believe it's in the Decano room. That used to be the room I was called to when I was in trouble. So hopefully I did a decent job and I'm not in trouble right now. Uh, third floor, uh, have a, please join us for a reception. Thank you so much for your participation. I think it's been a wonderful event. Thank you to EI, to David, to Fred, to Dennis, <laughs> EI staff here for putting this on. It's been a wonderful thing. Thank you. Thank you.